Hi, welcome to Pass Forward, Agendas for History Education. You can join the conversation by going to the website, the YouTube channel, or following us on Twitter. My name is Chris Martell, and I'm an assistant professor of social studies education at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. My provocation asks the question, if movements drive historical change, why do we organize history around powerful individuals? If you go into any history classroom in the English speaking world on any given day, you're likely to see students engaged in units that are usually organized around powerful rulers. For instance, Caesar in ancient Rome, the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, Victorian England. Here in the United States, you're likely to see in a US history classroom, a unit organized around the presidents of the United States, such as the age of Jackson. But this isn't just how classrooms organize history. It's often how national and state um, curriculum frameworks are organized, as well as the chapters you find in any history textbook. But I'd like to argue that this speaks to a fundamental flaw in history education, that we routinely focus on the acts of powerful individuals rather than the common people who often organize in movements for change. For instance, this is a picture of uh, this summer um, after the murder of George Floyd in the United States and globally, there were movements that formed for racial justice. Um, it's only when those movements happen that those important and powerful leaders have to take any steps because the people is what who holds um, those leaders accountable. In fact, this is a historical flaw to history education. We often organize our units around those people in power. Um, for instance, these are two textbooks that come uh, from the United States from the 19th century. Um, one organizes primarily around continents, the other or organizes primarily around important individuals, in this case, Christopher Columbus. Um, and embedded in this are actually kind of outsider views of, of these places, outsider views of the Americas, once Europeans show up, outsider views of Africa, uh, once Europeans um, begin to imperialize. And so I'd like to argue that these historical organizations are actually rooted in white supremacy. In fact, Herbert Spencer, um, perhaps one of the founders of scientific racism back in the late 19th century, argued for uh, the teaching of Western civilization. And he argued that this would help provide proof of European superiority. And he kind of saw the important leaders of the past as a way to prove that superiority. Um, in the United States, there was something called the Committee of Seven, um, which was led by six white men and, and one white woman. And they released in the 1890s a report that the curriculum should focus on European and white American civilization. And so to this day, some of the, the units that we organize history classrooms around, especially here in the United States, were decided by these groups. So what does this curriculum lead to? What happens when students are learning history through powerful individuals, and those powerful individuals tend to be white, tend to be men? Well, I again, argue that it leads to citizens thinking that one leader in the past made change. Whether that's John McDonald or Abraham Lincoln or Winston Churchill. And because of that, they see history as the action and agency of one individual, usually that person with great power, rather than the people collectively organized in movements. And even when we look at history that represents people's histories other than European or white people, um, we still organize that around powerful individuals. I would argue that the civil rights movement in the United States is often framed around Martin Luther King. The anti-apartheid movement in South Africa is framed around Nelson Mandela. Singapore's independence is framed around Lee Kuan Yew. And so what it leads to is that citizens, including students in the present, look for one leader to make change. So here in the United States, whether it's Barack Obama or Donald Trump being elected, the voters who voted for those presidents expected this one leader to come in and make change, granted very two very different types of change. Um, and this is because everything they've learned up until this point says one powerful leader is how change happens. It's even led to people not trusting movements. 
So for instance, here in the United States, polls of Americans have found that a majority of them do not believe past and present movements have made the United States better. The only movement that polls above 50% is the civil rights movement uh, at about 70%. But whether it be the labor movement here in the United States, anti-Vietnam War movement, LGBTQ rights movement, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, and Me Too, all poll generally under 50% for popular support. And at the same time, at least a certain groups, particularly those groups in power, feeling that no change is needed. For instance, only 37% of white Americans feel that the United States should go further in providing equal rights for people of color. Only 42% of Americans feel that more progress, American men feel there should be more progress made in gender equality. And only 37% of middle and upper class Americans believe that the advantages in life, uh, their advantages in life are a main, uh, the main factor is personal wealth. So I would argue that there's actually a missing paradigm in history education. And that paradigm is activist thinking. And activist thinking is perhaps uh, how we need to help students and you know, the future change makers of the world understand how societies improve, how the global community improves. For instance, here's a picture of the climate strike uh, over the last few years where students actually led the charge in many ways and led the change by marching and, and walking out of school to demand the world um, do something in regards to climate change and global warming. Over the last 50 years, there's been two paradigms that have really pushed us to think differently about history education. The first um, comes from cognitive psychologists. Sam Weinberg might be one of the most well-known. And in the late 80s, early 90s, they argued that history education should uh, model the thinking processes of professional historians. Here, they argue that students should be able to analyze and interpret the past much in the same way historians do. Then in the late 90s, early 2000s, another group argued that while it's important to analyze and interpret the past, it's even more important that citizens can use the past as a tool to participate in democracy. And this theory really came out of sociocultural theorists. Um, and, and I would label this thinking like a democratic citizen. What my co-author Kaylee Stevens and I argue is that there is a third paradigm in, social, in history education that we need to be thinking about. And that is thinking like an activist. We root our work in critical theory and we argue that you know, historical ideas and actions um, need to be analyzed in regards to movements and achieving justice. And to achieve this activist thinking, we argue there are three different pedagogical techniques that teachers should use to achieve this. In many ways, there's overlap with the first two paradigms, but we try and center these pedagogical techniques around justice and understanding the role of power and movements in the past. And so the first is social inquiry. Um, and here, you know, the first two groups that I just uh, spoke about, they also argue that inquiry should be the foundation of the social studies classroom, that students should be asking questions and using evidence to answer those historical questions. But we would argue that when inquiries become social, or some people might call them critical, um, the debatable questions must focus on issues of power and power relationships and who has power that the primary sources and secondary sources and other sources that we're using should center on the counter narratives from non-dominant groups. And finally, that those sources, teachers must be very careful to avoid essentializing the experiences of non-dominant groups, not only showing one source from a particular group, but making sure that it tells a more complex story often through multiple sources. We also argue that the curriculum should have a critical multiculturalism to it. And what makes a multicultural curriculum critical. Well, traditionally, multicultural curriculum um, have presented liberal views of multiculturalism. And this is a real kind of, uh, this is a, a tolerance oriented perspective. And while tolerance is not bad, it's the lowest level of uh, support for oppressed people, as Sonia Nato would call it. Instead, we argue that there needs to be critical views of the past, that students should be looking at how systems of oppression are maintained. Um, or created and maintained, 
Um, and, and, and here we take a lot from the work of Christine Sleater and others. And the last type of history education pedagogy that we argue for in the book is the, the idea of transformative democratic citizenship. We really take a lot of this idea from, from James Banks. And what he argues is that uh, in some societies, certain groups are intentionally left out of the democratic project. And it's the job of every citizen in those nations to ensure that everyone has full incorporation and equal political power. And so it's important that the history classroom teaches students how to use the levers of democracy to make society better, how to take action, um, and how to advocate on behalf of justice. It challenges students to consider how dem democracy is often be uh, uh, has often been fairer for some groups over others. And another component of this idea is uh, helping students understand the politics behind history and how history is political and shaped by political decisions and actors. Um, and it's framed by one's political ideologies, um, but it's not partisan. In fact, we've seen a rise in, uh, in what I would call partisan history, where certain um, political groups are trying to weaponize history to, um, to advocate for their view of history as the only truth. Instead, it's important that students can recognize um, that history is interpretive, is debatable, and that no one group has, um, has full say over, over what history is or was. Um, so let me give you some examples of teachers who are doing this type of um, justice-oriented history education. So for instance, this is Taylor Collins. She's a teacher here in, in Massachusetts in the United States. Um, and kind of taking this idea of history for justice she went back and re, uh, kind of reconceived her U.S. history classroom. Um, traditionally, in the United States, U.S. history starts when Europeans show up. Um, and in many ways, it makes students feel that um, the indigenous people didn't have a history before that. And what she decided to do is start her U.S. history class with the long uh, history of indigenous people in the United States before European uh, colonization. Um, and and then she told the story of US history after Europeans show up by centering uh, the, the native experience in her classroom. So they became the main narrative. And then students would learn about Europeans as they kind of entered the indigenous narrative. I'd also like to give this example from the Joseph Lee K-8, which is a, is a school here in Boston. Um, during the, um, the shooting of Michael Brown, um, students were learning about activism in the past and the, the, you know, wanted to hold their own racial justice protest. And so here's a picture from the local newspaper um, in solidarity with a lot of high school students who were staging a walkout. Um, the teachers of the Joseph Lee helped the students get permission and then, and then stage their own um, protest out in front of the school. And this was a really amazing way for them to connect the past to the present and kind of have them practice doing the work of activists and movements um, in, in the past, but doing it to issues that are important and relevant to them. Uh, and this is Malcolm Cawthorn. He's a teacher at Brookline High School here in the Boston area. Uh, and for many years, Malcolm Cawthorn has taught an African-American history course um, that a, a lot of students at the high school take. Uh, and and for, for years now, he has been retelling the American history class through the Black perspective and centering Black voices and Black events. And I think this is a great example of teaching history for justice in that kind of helping us rethink who's often left out of the narrative and who is not. And I'll conclude by uh, kind of suggesting if anybody likes these ideas and is really interested in what this might look like in practice, um, Kayleen Stevens and I have a new book out with Teachers College Press here in the United States. And in that book, we not only lay out the theory behind teaching history for justice, the research that supports it, but also offer some vignettes of of teachers and what this would look like uh, in, in the classroom. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciated doing this pass forward and uh, please visit the website. Please go to the YouTube channel and please uh, check out Twitter. Thanks so much.